Good evening, and thank you guys so much for joining us today, and welcome to Pakistani History and Women's Rights Issues with Betsy Silva. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Silva, again for coming. Um, to, you know, first of all, as aside from our great speaker here today, I wanted to go ahead and thank um, Rice students, Rice faculty, and especially um, some of our Houston community members that are here today. And uh, also from our Houston community members, we're lucky enough to have uh, Council General Baloch with us today. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, as well as uh, Asia Society, the Texas chapter, they've helped a lot with the outreach component of this event. And I really appreciate all their help. And on behalf of the Institute, we'd like to thank you guys as well. So. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the event today, Dr. Shehabuddin. She is uh, Assistant Professor of Political Science and Humanities here at Rice University. And she'll be uh, going through kind of our question and answer period as well and give a brief introduction on Ms. Sidwa. And afterwards, after the event, we would, uh, Ms. Sidwa would be glad to sign some of your books if you bought books after the event. And um, the question and answer period will proceed uh, after the discussion. So. Please enjoy, and thank you guys again for coming. Thank you all for making it here in this totally monsoon-like downpour, so we appreciate this. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome back to RICE this evening, Ms. Bopsi Sidwa. A resident of Houston for many years, Ms. Sidwa is one of South Asia's most prominent writers. Her novels deal with such varied topics as her personal experience of uh, the partition of the subcontinent in 1947, abuse against women, and immigration to the U.S. and diaspora life here. She was born in Karachi, Pakistan, and brought up in Lahore. She contracted polio as a young child, so as a result, she was educated at home until she was 15, and being at home and as, without being part of the large uh, community, she developed a passion for reading, which I guess led to writing. So keep that in mind, students, here. Um, she graduated from Kinnaird College for Women in Lahore and married young at 19. Something else to give, uh, uh, to think about for the students here. And she tells the story of how she wrote in secrecy initially because most of her husband's friends were businessmen. So she was worried that she, they would look on her as pretentious and, and odd. So she uh, didn't share her love of writing with um, her circle of friends initially. But I think now they know. Um, over the years, in addition to writing and raising her children, she found time to become an active champion of women's rights. She represented Pakistan in the Asian Women's Congress of 1975 and served on the advisory committee to Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto on women's development. She has taught at Columbia, University of Houston, Mount Holyoke College, Brandeis University, and the University of Southampton in England. And she's been a very appreciated visitor to a class I teach, Introduction to Asian Civilizations. And she's agreed to come back in a few weeks. So I know some of you are here, and so you'll get to hear a different take, um, uh, a, a different lecture from her in a few weeks. Her novels include The Crow Eaters, A Pakistani Bride, Cracking India, which was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year, and a quality paperback book club selection, an American Brat, and an anthology called City of Sin and Splendor, Writings on Lahore. The Canadian Indian filmmaker Deepa Mehta made Sidwa's novel Cracking India into the film Earth in 1998. It was part of a trilogy, Fire, which had its own controversy, um, Earth, and then Water. And then Babsi's latest novel, Water, is a novelization of the film um, Water, which was nominated um, for an Academy Award in the Best Foreign Film category um, a couple of years ago. Her works have been translated into several European and Asian languages, and her play, An American Brat, opened right here in Houston at Stages uh, Repertory Theater earlier this year and, and did very well. Among her many honors are the Bunting Fellowship at Harvard Radcliffe, the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Writers Award, the Sitara Imtiaz, Pakistan's highest national, on, on, national honor in the arts, and most recently, the Italian Premio Mondello 2007 for water. We are fortunate that you live in Houston and are delighted to have you here this evening to talk about Pakistan history and women's rights. Um, she'll speak for about 35, is that what we, 35? About 30 minutes, and then we'll have, 
<laughs> we'll have half an hour for questions. So think of questions, uh, because she said she likes answering questions more than giving a prepared speech. So um, that's where you can get to listen to more of her with the questions. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Ms. Uh, Babsi Sedwa. Thank you so much, and thank you all for coming in this rain, monsoon-like rain, as uh, Allura said. And Allura, thank you for a very charming introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the Baker Institute, and especially Melissa Lulen. I, I didn't meet her. I hope she's here. The events director for all the work she has put in. And of course, I thank the lovely Shireen Nasir, who has run around organizing the event and the student forum for inviting me. I also thank Asia Society for the community outreach. It's an honor to be at the Baker Institute. I've heard about it so much and you know, I've heard so many eminent people who have come here and uh, I, I don't think anybody knows this, but I did teach here, teach out here for two years and this was in the Continuing Education Center. There was a lovely lady there called Shirley Chu. Am I right? Hmm? Laura Chu, yes. And uh, she was a rookie. I was a rookie. I'd never taught before. And she enrolled 60 people into my class. <laughs> and I, I took one, I gave one class, and I realized that's impossible. So I divided it into two classes, and that's how we finished the semester. I, I really enjoyed them, and they enjoyed having me. But I enjoyed being in Rice above all. Uh, I will just uh, sort of encapsulate a little bit about the partition for you all. Uh, I won't go into details, because I would rather concentrate on uh, the present history. Is that OK? Google will tell you all about the cons uh, partition and all that. <laughs> Till 1947, India was part of the British Empire. They came as traders, saw the wealth, the gold, indigo, mineral spices, and bit by bit, like boa constrictors, swallowed India. India was not a homogeneous country. There was the big Mughal Empire in the center. The north was occupied by Ranjit Singh. And there were other sort of kingdoms. And they all owed their allegiance, except for Ranjit Singh, to uh, the Mughal Emperor. And the British played a very treacherous role with the Mughal Emperor. In 1957, there was a great Indian mutiny. This is when the East India Company gifted India to Queen Victoria. And it became officially a part of the British Empire. This was a combined assault on the British troops, on their families, by you know, the Hindus and the Muslims and the sepoys, which is the conscripts and the civilians. And it scared the British so much that thereafter they instituted the divide and rule policy, which is still <coughs> unwinding. And this was that they started to cause a big, a big religious division between the Muslims and the Hindus. When you're an occupying power, it is so easy to do that. Uh, I think we see some of that unfolding in Iraq. Meanwhile, the Indian National Congress that included Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, had started agitating for independence from the British and Gandhiji, as the Americans say, Gandhi. <laughs> uh, and I never say Gandhi, I always say Gandhiji, because the honorific is there as a mark of respect, had launched his nonviolent freedom struggle, which was late, later also taken up by Mr. King. Women did play a strong role in the freedom struggle, too. In fact, this morning only, my husband told me, uh, my father-in-law was very involved in the uh, 
Gandhian Satyagar movement. He was from Karachi. In fact, he became a minister in the first Nehru cabinet. And my husband saw a lot of this, and he remembers vividly seeing a scene where women lay down on the tracks of a tram, tram car, and uh, nobody dared to do anything to them there. So what they did was uh, throw buckets of urine on them, you know. And this was a personal story I heard today, so I thought I must narrate it to you. After World War II, the British elected a new prime minister, Attlee, to replace Churchill. Churchill was a very stubborn old man, and he would have never given up the British Empire, you know, that old-time pride he had. And, but Attlee's and his parliament agreed to give India its independence. At independence, the Muslim minority felt they needed some assurances from the Hindu majority that their interests would be looked after in independent India. Unfortunately, they could not settle on terms, and the Muslim League, under Jinnah's leadership, finally asked for a separate state. It wasn't till 19... The partition took place in 1947, and till 1946, Jinnah, who was, a, who was one of the founding members of the National Congress and started with other people like Annie Besant and uh, Motilal Nehru, the freedom struggle, he didn't want a partition. And it was not till 1946 that he thought, well, it is inevitable. We should have a partition. And that is how, in 1947, a new nation was born. I will read a very little bit from Cracking India to give you the novelist's perspective. Mm, I think I'll just read one small bit. I won't read two. You know, India, people were living together in Hindus, Muslims, in the same neighborhood. And this book is written from a child's perspective. And her world overnight undergoes a change. She sees that people who were all unified under her beloved nanny, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, everybody, suddenly she discovers they not only have uh, na sort of names, she didn't even know their names, but they have religions. So I won't read you that part, but in, or maybe I should. <laughs> Yeah, it won't make sense otherwise. There, this is a child's perspective. There is much disturbing talk. India is going to be broken. Can one break a country? And what happens? If they break it, where are houses? Or crack it further up on Waris Road? How will I ever get to Godmother's then? I ask cousin. Rubbish, he says. No one's going to break India. It's not made of glass. He always asks him questions. I ask Aya. They'll dig a canal, she ventures. This side for Hindustan and this side for Pakistan. If they want two countries, that's what they'll have to do, crack India with a long, long canal. Gan the poor people didn't know what all this was about, what Pakistan was, what the British leaving meant. So there was confusion. They said, oh, India's to be divided, how, etc." Gandhi, Jinnah, Nehru, Mountbatten, our names are here, and I become aware of religious differences. It is sudden. One day, everybody is themselves, and the next day, they are Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Christian. People shrink, dwindling into symbols. Aya, the nanny, is no longer just my all-encompassing Aya. She is also a token, a Hindu. 
Carried away by a renewed devotional fervour, she expends a small fortune in joysticks, flowers and sweets on the gods and goddesses in the temples. Imam Deen and Yusuf, turning into religious zealots, warn mother they will take Friday afternoons off for the Juma prayers. And this is how it goes on, and the girl wonders, what are we Parsis, you know? Where do we belong? Playing British gods under the ceiling fans of the Philetti's Hotel, behind Queen Victoria's garden skirt, there was a huge statue of Queen Victoria there. The Ratcliffe Commission deals out Indian cities like a pack of cards. Lahore is dealt to Pakistan, Amritsar to India, Sialkot to Pakistan, Pathankot to India. I am Pakistani in a snap, just like that. A new nation is born. India has been divided after all. Did they dig that long, long canal Aya mentioned? So this was a sort of bewilderment, but then uh, Pakistan came into being. And, uh, well, you know, a few days ago on 14th of August, it was Pakistan Day, and we, I visited the consulate on that day had a lovely, it was a lovely occasion, thank you. And uh, the BBC called me and said if they wanted to take an interview about this day. So I went to the University of Houston and gave a radio interview. And the first question, that, uh, And the first question they asked is, what if the Qaid e Azam, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, were to land in Pakistan today, what would be his reaction? And it was a live program, and I very spontaneously said, he will be dismayed. Because he had a different vision of Pakistan. This is what he said on his address to the Parliament of Pakistan on 11th August, 1947. He was just elected president. He was Pakistan's first president, naturally, the founder of the nation. And he said, you may belong to any religion or caste or creed. That has nothing to do with the business of the state. His vision was very secular. And that was the ideology for Pakistan right for 10 years. It was just named the Republic of Pakistan. And 10 years later, it was renamed as the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. And although it's not a theocratic state, it began to sound like one. This was in 1956, ten, almost 10 years after partition. Jinnah died a year later, and uh, Pakistan became sort of rudderless. It was Pakistan's misfortune. He was a much older man. He was, I think, in his 80s. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, he, was, he had tuberculosis, and he died. India had advantage here that Nehru, who took over the reins first, he lived on for 16 years, and he was able to establish his vision. Uh, is Pardeep Anand here? I doubt if he is, okay. Anyway, he also told me another thing, which uh, went to India's advantage, and... Pakistan did not do this, and this was that uh, India got rid of the feudal system straight away, and Pakistan was not able to do so. It didn't even think of it to begin with, and huge chunks of land, of, of the land of Pakistan, still belong to individual landlords. They, they still wield enormous power, and they have a stranglehold on Pakistan politics. And that is a large reason people in Pakistan distrust democracy. After this, there was fighting between various political parties. And every 11 months, a new prime minister popped up. You know, And this went on till uh, 
Field Marshal, Marshal Ayub Khan took over, and a lot of people were relieved. He was very handsome, very popular, and he introduced, importantly for this discussion, where we are talking about family issues, uh, we are talking about women's issues, he introduced the family laws to protect women in the new country. These gave them basic rights. A woman could not be divorced so easily. It was, a, it was a sort of, not religiously sanctioned, but it had become sort of a custom that a man could say thrice to his wife, talaq, 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 which meant I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and that was the end of it, he was divorced. So he made this illegal, that you cannot do this. She couldn't be sort of divorced arbitrarily. And he also uh, made the Quranic law so that it read in a way that made a divorce more difficult and the process favored women. Uh, a man couldn't so easily divorce a woman. Conversely, a clause was written in to the marital contract to allow women to divorce a husband because very often if a woman wanted to divorce a husband and the man didn't want, want it, there was no way she could get a divorce. So he now put it into the marital contract that she could, if she wanted, have a divorce. This, these laws affected mostly the elite women. Because they knew what, oh, these are our rights, we can do this, we can do that. But there was the organization called APWA, All Pakistan Women's Organization, and many other such organizations who started spreading the word and filtering it down to the lower levels. He tried to introduce land reform. That was, you know, something so urgent. But the bureaucracy would not allow it. They would put up hurdle after hurdle because it was in their vested interest to work hand in glove with many of the landlords because they both benefited from them. Ayub Khan also introduced the first constitution. Uh, it was called Basic Democracies with a capital B and D. And it, it was to take small steps towards the establishment of a full-fledged democracy. But like all people in power, he would not let go the power and he stayed on and on till a decade passed. It's so hard once you've experienced this sort of authority and power to let go. And in the end, the people agitated very much, so he held an election. And he stood against Fatima Jinnah, Mamad Ali Jinnah's sister. And uh, this election was rigged, and the people up, uh, sort of made an uproar. And he handed over power to Yahya Khan, General Yahya Khan. The only thing I can say in favor of General Yahya Khan, who was a pretty dissolute person, is that he had the f held the first really fair and free elections. Now, I have not explained one thing. When the partition took place, two wings of Pakistan appeared. One was West Pakistan, in the Punjab, the northwest frontier where I am, and with a thousand miles of ter Indian territory in between, there was East Pakistan. Now this was a geographical absurdity. There was no connection between the two people. The Bengalis and the Punjabis and the Pathans, I mean these set people, are totally, the language is different, they look different, everything about them is different. Their culture is different, their dress is different. It is like, you know, something like, oh, well, uh, Mexico is a Catholic country, so let's make it a part of the Vatican. You know, something like that. <laughs> it, it just would not work. Now, when these elections, now, in, during this period, the East Pakistanis were getting very restless because the West Pakistanis were bullies. They didn't treat them very well. They were a little fairer, a little taller, a little uh, plumper, and like sort of fairer, taller people everywhere. 
they felt they were superior to these small little Bangladeshi, you know, Bengalis. And they treated them with contempt. And the Bengalis naturally became, am I right, Allura? <laughs> <laughs> and they became very resentful. And there, but then the election took, took pla elections took place under Yahya. And West Pakistan had a very charismatic leader in the shape of Mr. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who was the father of Benazir Bhutto. And East Pakistan had an equally charismatic and popular leader, Mujibur Rahman. And when the elections took place in each wing, a thumping majority won the seats. And then there was the war. And during the war, uh, sort of uh, Bengal broke away and it became Bangladesh. That is today's Bangladesh was at one time East Pakistan. I was drawn into the emotional storm of Pakistani politics when Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, with Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's electoral victory in 1971. Now this was a time of tremendous hope. As a woman active in women's issues, as a member of a minority community, I belong to the Zoroastrian faith, which is totally different from the Muslim faith. I floated on the swell of his egalitarian rhetoric and at this time, all women felt empowered. They joined the workforce in great numbers. They were much more visible than they'd ever be. They became professionals. They took to law, architecture, hotel management. Some, one woman even became a pilot. Uh, schools and doc being, becoming doctors in the medical profession was always con considered kosher for women, not nurses, but doctors, because nurses would have to touch men, so nobody wanted to become a nurse. But doctors, the women could become. So there were women developing schools and uh, in the medical professions. Bhutto was, uh, his, I think, one great achievement was that he empowered the masses. Nobody bothered about the poor people. The masses were poor. Nobody considered their opinions. Nobody thought they were worth anything. And Bhutto somehow infused them with a sense of self-respect and also a sense of self-worth. And he appealed to them. Nobody had ever appealed to them. Okay, vote for me. I'll do this for you. I'll do that for you. And he did that. The masses adored him. It didn't matter what anybody said. Uh, when the opposition people tried to smear him by saying, oh, you know, he drinks, he drinks alcohol. He's, what sort of a Muslim is he? And he's, he said, uh, and he would sort of roll up his sleeves and open his shirt and, you know, act like he was one of the local masses. And then he, he said, Yes, I drink alcohol, but I don't drink poor people's blood. And of course, he got thunderous applauses. You know, he, he had a gift for this sort of uh, rhetoric, prompt answers, and this won over a lot of people. I remember, you know, he also was a dandy. He wore only Savile Row suits and very uh, fancy shoes, and he was always very well turned out. And again, when the opposition told the people that, you know, he spends so much money on his clothes, he's just pretending to sort of appeal to you. This man is not truthful. And they were ready to forgive him anything. They said, don't say that. We, we will let him do what he likes. He is our bridegroom. <laughs> you know, I remember this very clearly because at that time, I too was extremely enamored of him and his what he was saying as a woman, as, as a minority person. He won on the slogan of Roti Kapra Makan, which is bread, uh, kapra is uh, cloth, and house, shelter. He won on these slogans. And succeeded, and he's the only one who did succeed to an extent in introducing land reform to try and break up the stranglehold of feudal lords on politics. He was himself, of course, a feudal lord. 
But he did uh, one very uh, a thing which really put everybody into trouble, and that is he started nationalizing. He nationalized the banks, he nationalized uh, the heavy industries, he nationalized uh, shipping, and uh, this uh, spoiled the economy because banking was going very well. He nationalized cotton gins, but not cotton industries. It was sort of arbitrary. He also dismissed about 300 bureaucrats for sloth and incompetence. And I think a lot of the people loved that. Together with his land reforms and, and getting rid of the bureaucrats, this was his downfall because now it was the powerful people who suddenly started agitating. People who had a vested interest in land, in factories, in, in, in thinking that, oh, he is subverting the masses. Uh, one incident comes to mind at that time when I was going to parties. One of the ladies there said, guess what my driver said? He said he wants to own his own car. Can you imagine that? So you know, this was a sort of uh, feeling he aroused in the masses that you can be equal to anybody, you know, and this I think was a great thing. But these very powerful people, they engineered sort of riots. They were very strange riots. Uh, the begums, the women, would come in their cars and the drivers would open their doors and they would, then they would join the pro uh, processions, you know and shout slogans and get into the car and go home again. <laughs> so this was the sort of elitist revolt. And they appealed to the army to take over. And General Zia took over the reins of power in a military coup in 1976. And he imposed, again, the second military rule. Ayub Khan was the first. Now the women's issues took a very big setback. Bhutto's ouster by General Zia, Zia Hul Haq is his full name, and the hanging of Bhutto two years later erased overnight whatever progress uh, the women had achieved and the minorities had achieved. Because Bhutto had been, you know, one felt the minorities mattered as much as the majority Muslim community under Bhutto. But it changed under General Ziaul Haq because he imposed separate electorate, which was that the minorities would have to vote for a minority person. And the public, the general public would vote for the Muslim leaders, so they were the more empowered. And nobody bothered to woo the minority leaders. And we discovered something called the Hadood Ordinances had been loosed in our midst. It was part of General Zia's alleged uh, process of Islamization, mission of Islamization. And he used his particular brand of religion to perpetuate his power under military rule. The Hadood Ordinances galvanized women to action <coughs> and plunged me into the heart of the protest movement. And at that time, we few women got together and formed the Women's Action Forum. Thereafter, we became very militant. Uh, I'll read you a little bit about this, again, to give you the writer's perspective. Zareen, she is... Uh, one of the characters here, she is re uh, saying this. Something called the Hadood Ordinances had been loosed, uh, had been sneaked up upon them. When they read about the Famida and Allah Baksh case, the couple who had eloped to get married had been accused of committing adultery or zina by the girl's father. They were sentenced to death by stoning. On an appeal to a higher court, the charges were dismissed. Fortunately, 
Stoning to death was de uh, declared un-Islamic. Am I too far from the mic? Was declared un-Islamic because there is no mention in the Quran of forced stoning. But the shock that provoked, you know, the sort of indignation which became countrywide was the case of Safia Bibi. The blind 16-year-old servant girl, pregnant out of wedlock as a result of rape, was charged with adultery. She was sentenced to three years rigorous imprisonment and 15 lashes. Safia Bibi's father, in bringing the charges against her uh, rapist, had been unwittingly trapped by the Zina Ordinance, because by now the Zina Ordinance was in force. Although Pakistan got the name Repub uh, Islamic Republic of Pakistan, Sharia law or Islamic law had not been introduced, and Zia introduced it, sneaked it in this way, and nobody knew that this had happened till these cases came up. It required the testimony of four honorable male eyewitnesses or eight female eyewitnesses to establish rape. The startled women who had enjoyed equal status under the previous law, which was the British law, realized that their worth had been discounted by 50%. Since it is scarcely possible to produce four male eyewitnesses given the private nature of rape. <laughs> and being blind, she was not considered a reliable witness. How could she give witness? She, she couldn't even see her assailant. Since rape could not be proved, she was charged under a subcategory of rape, fornication outside the sanctity of marriage. Safia Bibi was not punished thanks to the pressure of the legal community and the women's and, uh, groups and the human rights activists. We all came out on the streets burning whales, voicing our protests and beating our breasts. And Zareen was among them. The verdict was rescinded. But how often could one do this? Every time we heard of this severe injustice, we would do something about it, and there were women lawyers, and there were other, not only women, the men lawyers, everybody joined in to try and put a stop to this. But sad to say, once religious law is introduced anywhere in the world, it is almost impossible to risk it. Now, while this was going on, there were many apologists who agreed with the letter of the law, if not its spirit. They produced a litany of precedent and dire argument to support the verdict. The gender bias was appalling. All this had been set in place shortly after Mr. Bhutta was hung. I think that's about it. Mr. Bhutto's hanging. If I go into that, that'll take an hour, so I'll just ignore that. Uh, the Hadood ordinances are a collection of five hastily crafted Islamic law dealing with rape, robbery, alcoholic consumption, and adultery. Asma Jahangir, she's a wonderfully strong woman and a great lawyer, writes in her book, Hadood Ordinances, a Divine Sanction. Even amongst the fundamentalists, there is a body of opinion that these laws do not reflect the percepts and the spirits of Islam. At that time, hundreds of women suddenly started rotting in the jails under the Zina ordinance, under the adultery law. This law was like a weapon in the, ha in the hands of men. As it is, it is a very male-dominated society, not among the, the uh, more educated women, because then they dominate their men, but <laughs> among the classes, it was a very male-dominated society, so that uh, if a girl wanted to uh, marry 
uh, out of the wishes of her father or her brother and was adamant about it, they would put false claims, uh, accuse her of false claims, take her to the mullah and say she's committed adultery and she'd be put into prison. It also gave husbands a, a stick over their wives because uh, if they wanted uh, a sort of divorce and wanted to get married again, and this was very humiliating for a man, he would accuse her of committing adultery and she was thrown into jail. And you know, just innocent young girls and women were languishing in jails. And these men knew that the punishment could be stoning to death. Fortunately, it was then proved that that, ca that cannot happen, but they couldn't have cared less. I'll just read you a little bit about Mamad Ali Jinnah's advocacy of the, of the participation of women in Pakistan. In his speech in Aligarh on March 10th, 1944, he said, it is a crime against humanity that our women are shut up within the four walls of the house as prisoners. There is no sanction anywhere for the deplorable condition in which our women have to live. When he says anywhere, he means there's no sanction in the Quran. Uh, my parents, very good friend, used to teach at the Lahore College of Women, and she taught Arabic. And she said, I have read the Quran from the beginning to the end, and nowhere does it say you should cover your face. Not only that, nowhere does it say you should even cover your head, except when you're at prayer. The only thing that the Quran states is that you should cover your uh, sexually attractive parts or sexual parts. You know, be modest, dress modestly. And so all these habits which have crept into, uh, well, you know, it also, parda, it's called the parda system, segregation, the veil. This was also part of the Hindu tradition. Even the Hindu women, even now in the villages, wouldn't appear in front of their uh, father-in-law without a sari hanging you know, low over the head. So these were more cultural traditions uh, rather than religious traditions. Now I come to American foreign policy and Pakistan as a key, a key ally. It's very interesting. After partition, India developed a very cozy relationship with the Soviet Union. At this, America felt, you know, they needed to restore some sort of balance of influence there, so they wooed Pakistan. Pakistan was a very willing wooey, they loved it. <laughs> uh, the Soviet Union built India a steel mill, it gave, uh, it developed its armaments, its industry, and the U.S. gave Pakistan aid. Now, aid is a misnomer. It is not a handout. It's not a free gift. Aid meant uh, the U.S. gave Pakistan huge loans for the exclusive purchase of American armaments, heavy machinery, uh, probably fertilizers and things like that. It had to be used to uh, enrich America in a way and medicines. At that time, when I would go to India, I would find I could get a bottle of antibiotics for two rupees, and it cost 80 rupees in Pakistan. So this sort of stifled Pakistan's industrial growth in a way. It wasn't a very healthy relationship. But what interests me most and will interest you most was a strange connection, an axis between Pakistan and Texas. <laughs> and this is the amazing relationship that developed after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. It, I call it the Charlie Wilson, Joanne Herring, who was now jo Joanne Roberts, General Ziaul Haq phase. 
This is all being described in a book called Charlie Wilson's War. It's a wonderful book. It's much more of a thriller than uh, anything Tom Clancy or Lacar would write because Charlie Wilson is a, is a very colorful character. And there's so much, so much happening there. The film, there's going to be a film made on this. I, I wonder if you all have heard of it, called Charlie Wilson, with Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts, and Om Puri, who is going to play the role of Jinnah. The Indians will know about that. But Charlie Wilson was a bachelor congressman from Texas who had a habit of landing in Pakistan with two favorite strippers and cocaine. And of course, this was all eye candy for the Pakistanis. They loved it. His good time Charlie exterior masked an extraordinary mind, a deep sense of patriotism, and a passion for the underdog. And in the early 1980s, the underdog was Afghanistan, which had been brutally invaded by the Soviet Union. Uh, I actually met uh, Charlie Wilson the Asia Society invited him when his book was launched, and I met him there. He was a tall, very good-looking man. He was elderly, but I'm sure he must have been extremely good-looking. And I felt Tom Hanks might be a little too short to play his role. <laughs> but then Tom Hanks is a, a, a tremendous actor. I, I don't think anybody can act as well, so let's see what happens. Wilson was a six foot four inch Texas congressman. This, I didn't know if, I don't know if I mentioned, this event was organized by Asia Society. He was a Texas congressman, liberal on social issues. Now I'm quoting uh, from the Publishers Weekly, a review of his book, Charlie Wilson's War. Liberal on social issues, but rabidly anti-communist. He fought his elitist colleagues, which were the other parliamentarians, almost as ruthlessly as he fought the Soviet Union. His friend jo Joanne Herring Roberts now, who was also his lover at times, was one of the wealthiest women in Texas. I don't know how many of you know of her. Uh, let me see a little taller hands. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad. Because she seems to be quite a remarkable woman, you know? She just took action wherever it was needed. And she thought, well, the America was not helping the freedom fighters, the Mahajadeen in Afghanistan enough. And she really prodded Charlie Wilson to give more armaments and to push more, uh, to help them in a bigger way. She was as anti-communist as Charlie Wilson. They both became good friends with General Zia. And she, by the way, also became the honorary Pakist uh, council general for Pakistan. And she was a wonderful council general. They became good friends with General Zia. I have to say something here. And that is General Zia was such a figure of fun for us in Pakistan. He photographed very badly. <laughs> he had a little gap in the front teeth. His face came out flat. He had a little funny mustache. And, and we called him, as a joke, Terry Thomas. You know, he's that English comedian who looks a lot like that. In the 1990s, I happened to actually see him and meet him. And he was a transformed man. He just photographed badly. He was quite handsome in real life. He, was, he had a ruddy complexion. He glowed. He was personable. And I can quite imagine why uh, Charlie Wilson and uh, you know, uh, what, what was her name? I forget. Hmm? Joanne ha could, could uh, mix with him so well.
Now, this was another strange thing that whereas the population more or less hated him for what he'd done, and the women in particular hated him, in, re in personal life, he was so genial and charming, and his wife didn't observe Parda, and you know, they were not as fundamentalist as one had thought. And I remember Khushwan Singh, who is a very eminent uh, writer in India. He's a sort of grand old man of Delhi. He came to Lahore one day and he visited us. And I said, what are you here for? And he said, I'm going for Bhutto's hanging. That was the time when this was supposed to take place. And I said, is he going to be hung? You know, we were all distraught. And he said, well, that's the news I have and I'm going to cover it. And he went there. And he stayed in the hotel, and then he came back, and he said, no, the hanging did not take place. Uh, what I saw from my hotel room was a whole bunch of um, tanks, but the hanging did not take place, so I'm going back. And he said, but one thing I have to tell you, I came prepared to hate Zia, but I ended up liking him very much. And this was a strange reaction from a lot of people about General Zia. Charlie Wilson, by brilliantly leveraging his position on the Defense Appropriations Committee, he was one of the senior members there, extracted what eventually amounted to $1 billion a year to support the Afghan Mujahideen in their battle against the Soviet. It was a proxy war that the Afghan soldiers uh, fought on behalf of Afghanistan. It was the last of the Cold War on the hot theater of Afghanistan. But as you know, and as we know, the outcomes of war are totally unpredictable. When Germany started attacking and strong arming and showing off and flexing its muscles, did it ever know it would lose the war? When the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, did they believe that they could not defeat this tiny country. I mean, they had already annexed Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, and all the other Stans, and many other places. And uh, they thought they would just gobble it up very fast. They had already had quite a connection with Afghanistan at one stage, at, just before. I, I think uh, Iraq is another example where we thought the shock and awe of the bombardment would lead to the collapse and the welcome of American soldiers. So the outcomes of war never turn out to be what is expected. But the Soviet Union collapsed very rapidly, much more rapidly than America or anybody had thought, because they were bled by the Afghan resistance, and they were disgraced at home. Now, I'll just describe a little bit about this. It was, a, America did not believe that the Soviets would collapse so fast and leave Afghanistan so rapidly. So they started a program of trying to train future generations of Afghan Muhajideen to keep on continue fighting the Soviet Union and continue bleeding them. For this purpose, now by this time, we had three million refugees in Pakistan. Huge camps had been set up on the borders of Afghanistan, Pakistan, inside Pakistan. And with the help of uh, Saudi Arabia and this was narrated, and I heard it on TV, by a CIA director. They set up, they established what is now known as the madrasas. Madrasas really mean school, but these were devoted solely to teaching them the Wahhabi form of Islam. Pakistan is not a Wahhabi Islamic country. It is more the Sufi, it has more of the Sufiistic tradition. It has saints, it believes in saints, and uh, it, it believes in the sort of ghazals and uh, nats and kawalis, and, it, and whereas the Wahhabi form is very severe and very straight-laced. And these little texts of the Wahhabi faith were published in 
Ohio for $2 million and distribute it to the students in these camps. Because they thought they were going to now create, you see, in the meantime, they had already spread the word. And these are, the Afghans are a very poor, illiterate sort of people, very warlike. I mean, they love to have a quarrel. But uh, they are credulous people, and they were told, if you hold a Quran, oh, good God, I'm talking much more than I should. <laughs> yes, of course. That if you hold a, uh, a sort of a Quran out here, no bullet will so, uh, kill you. And these students known as Talibs, because a student is known as Taliba, Talib, became the Taliban. When Benazir Bhutto came into power, she supported them and America supported them because by now, Afghanistan had reeled into a free form. After the Soviets left, the Americans, like spoiled children, we abandoned Afghanistan and went away and we let it reel into, into just nothingness. Not a wall was left standing there. And in this strange condition, Benazir Bhutto and Americans also thought that the Taliban, and the Taliban were little teenagers by this time, they were war orphans, the children of the Mahajadeen who had fought, already brainwashed into this very straight-laced sort of Islam. And they were encouraged to go into Afghanistan, and the Afghans, who are very proud, laid down their guns, they said, protect our women, and the only way they knew how to protect them from the other warlords and the, and the anarchy that was going on was to put them into burqa. When there's no wall left standing, what else do you do? Anyway, I've overspoken. Okay. Uh, I just want to say one more word. Musharraf and the present day has been able to, because he's a sort of dictator, has been able to affect the Hadood ordinance to an extent. These, these things have been tabled in the assembly, but the, uh, the jailed women have all been freed under the Protection of Women Act. And the, the fundamentalists stormed out of the assembly when this was done. A motion to modify the adultery laws has been passed by the current parliament. They have still to be approved by the Senate the conservative members have vowed to block its passage and they can create street trouble. I'm sorry, I really over-talked. Uh, I, I would be very happy to take questions. Understanding that the suffix uh, "stan" means land, and I just didn't know what the prefix "bakis" meant when the meaning of Pakistan. <laughs> you, do, you don't know? Where are you from? I'm Indian. Okay. <laughs> Pakistan means the land of the pure. Pak means purity, and stan means land, so it is the land of the pure. There's a lot of irony in that. <laughs> <laughs> the name also came about to, with the first letter of all yes, the different uh, provinces. That's right, right. yes. Punjab, Afghanistan, right. uh, Kashmir. Sin. Uh, Sin. 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 Sin, right. And then the son of uh, the son. Right. So if you write them down, you also get 
work in Pakistan. You see, it works in, in two. Professor Shahbuddin is a historian. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I want her by my side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Okay. I could see him. He's close enough. <laughs> With the recent episodes in Pakistan, such as the mosque episode, the chief justice episode, now the Nawab Sharif episode, and possibly the Benazir Bhutto episode, <laughs> what kind of role that America will play before our election and before Pakistan? Well, America has had this sort of, we are almost uh, entwined. Mm -hmm. We can't get rid of each other. We try to. You know, Pakistan tries to distance itself and America tries to impose sanctions, but when inevitably we get together again. <laughs> and uh, it is happening again because uh, Musharraf is very important to America because of the war on terror, but he's also getting to be unpopular. Of course, the fundamentalists are, well, the fundamentalists are partly to, uh, to uh, you can blame them on the Soviet invasion because from that time on this fundamentalism started. There was, when we used to have elections in Pakistan, not even three of the mullahs or the religious parties could get their seats and very often even their deposits were forfeited. They got such few votes. And in the last election, and there were elections, no matter what people say, a whole bunch of uh, people from the frontier got elected, and they were all sort of rapidly fundamentalist people. Now, don't forget, at one stage, northern Pakistan and Afghanistan were one country. It was Afghanistan. And the British could never control Afghanistan. Nobody could, so they divided Afghanistan, so that half <clears throat> of Afghanistan is now in Pakistan, and half is what we call Afghanistan. And when the intense bombing of Afghanistan started, everybody had relatives sitting in northern Pakistan, people who were killed. So there is great anger and great ferment there against the Americans. And now what can mobilize them is religion and Talibanization. And this is what is playing into the politics today. And General Zia, I'm sorry, General Musharraf, still has a role to play so far as America is concerned. But he's getting, uh, a lot of factions are against him now. He's getting in a way unpopular. So there are very strong negotiations now to get Benazir Bhutto back. And apparently she has agreed. She will come back. There's the huge UN cry was, oh, General uh, uh, Musharraf should take off his uniform, take off his uniform. So I believe he has agreed to take off his uniform, which means he won't be head of the military. Uh, I mean, he will be head of the military, but covertly. <laughs> but he will be head of state. He will be president. And Benazir Bhutto will probably be the prime minister. Today, as things stand, that is what it is. Nawaz Sharif became prime minister twice, or president twice, both times illegally. And both times when Benazir was dismissed first for incompetence, there was a vote of no confidence against her, and Nawaz Sharif took over. And the second time, there was uh, she was dismissed for corruption. Her husband was extremely corrupt. You know, he was known as Mr. Hundred <laughs> Percent. And so they were dismissed. Uh, but people, it's amazing Bhutto's popularity. People don't realize it because no matter how often Benazi stands for power, she wins. In the last election, though she was not allowed there, the PPP party won a lot of votes when General Zia I mean, that parliament just now holds a lot of people party votes. So this will work, I think. Hmm. Um, yeah. Um, when Joanne I'm Karen... sorry, I just realized people haven't been introducing themselves. Oops. Okay. <laughs> That's Michelle Smith. Okay, I'll sit there. <laughs> When Joanne Herring was a brunette, she had the first television show in Houston, the Joanne King Show, and um, she was 
uh, very effective as a fundraiser for many years here. I was wondering if she was able to raise private donations uh, for Pakistan. Uh, she she was a great socialite, and she threw lavish parties for Zia. She visited General Zia al Haq, visited America very often, and she introduced him to all the elite of Texas. You know? And uh, I'm sure, and they were all very motivated, gung ho cowboys, you know, <laughs> all against the. You know, all against the Soviet Union. In fact, most so many Americans I met said we want to go to Afghanistan, and this was in even in South in, uh, South in Carolina and Atlanta. I said, why do you want to go to Afghanistan? They said, we want to kill us a communist. You know, there was this sort of peculiar feeling at that time. So everybody was willing to help, and I'm sure they gave a lot of donations. Um, I was wondering, what do you think are the most promising efforts going on right now to help women's status in Pakistan? Like, are there any good NGOs and stuff like that? And how can women and men here in the States help? But first of all, one has to realize that although Pakistan is a faraway country and it has a sort of bad rap and one feels sometimes it's it's harboring terrorists, and sometimes it is uh, <coughs> uh, fighting against and fighting with America against the terrorists. Pakistani women are generally, a lot of them are like me, are like uh, the young ladies and a lot of people sitting here. They are a sophisticated people, and they will muddle their way through. The women fight their own battles. But you cannot fight the forces that have been unleashed, the religious forces that have been unleashed because of the Afghan war and the Talibanization of that country. It'll take a long while for this generation of Talibans to die out or something to happen. Because the average silent majority of Pakistanis don't want <coughs> this at all. There was an interesting thing. Margaret Warner, I don't know how many of you saw this, uh, on Jim, on, Leher, on the Leher Report on uh, National Public Television, reported from Pakistan all of last week. Did anybody see this program? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She interviewed people from all walks of life, from the left, from the right. They, most of them just did not want extremism. They wanted to get along with their normal lives, with their businesses. And they were very disappointed that all Pakistanis were thought of as terrorists in the West, especially when they believed in the three A's, Allah, Army, and America. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know what, how you can help is by not stereotyping the women there, by realizing they have their own culture. The parda system, if I had time, I would talk to you. But it's like high heels. I would compare parda with high heels. <laughs> it is as debilitating. And little girls, <laughs> little girls want to wear a burqa and walk around in them when they're about 12 or 10, or, you know. And it is also a status symbol. When the very poor don't wear burqa, the very rich don't wear, the middle, upper middle class doesn't wear. But when from the very poor, a family goes into just a little better off, <coughs> and they feel, oh, well, now I've reached a stature of being a lady of leisure, and I want to announce this to the whole world, they wear a burqa, <coughs> because they don't need to work you know, on the fields or with their husband. Mm -hmm. So it is a status symbol which does not upset them so much. You know? mm -hmm. Of course, I think it's a very restrictive garment, because it prevents them from swimming, cycling, so many things. So many women have not even been outside 15 meters outside their village in the mountainous areas, you know. They spend their whole lives in that little village. But this is, again, something imposed by geography. The mountains are so high. They live at 16,000 feet, if you can imagine what that is. Um, 
There's a hand up at the back for a very long time. Pakistani American. Thank you for having me, Salman. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know, as a Pakistani American, um, I don't pretend to be somebody that's very involved in Pakistan. I haven't been there very much. But what do you see as the worst possible outcome for Pakistan within my lifetime? Hopefully under 75 years. <laughs> <laughs> Best possible outcome. And what can the Pakistani diaspora community do to go from the worst possible to the best possible outcome? Well, we have to change this image of being a terrorist country, of, uh, you know, uh, just be natural and normal. What else can you do? Because even the comedians are now branding Muslims as terrorists, saying Muslim is, uh, Islam is a bad religion. You know, uh, the, the rap is very sad, what is happening. The Muslims are being demonized. And I think the worst case scenario would be that if the way this frenzy is building, if they bomb Pakistan, that would be a terrible thing to happen. And I hope they don't. Because there are people like you and me and thousands and thousands and millions of people. You know? And uh, Pakistan is a very beautiful country. It's got the K2, the 25 highest peaks of the world are there in Pakistan. It's beautiful scenically. And the best scenario is, of course, that ever since the inception of Pakistan, I've been hearing it'll last one year, no more than one year. <laughs> and it's been 60 years now. <laughs> so we will definitely go on and always have America to help us or harm us or whatever happens. <laughs> we are joined at the hip somehow. Hi, I'm Tracy Conwell. I'm an attorney in, in uh, Houston, and I attended Rice. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, the question I have is the uh, depiction, the portrayal that you gave of the four uh, four eyewitnesses, the men, and uh, to uh, prove uh, rape, and, and four eight, if you were a female. Um, it, did I understand you correctly that that's no longer the law? And could you tell me what is the current state? of representation uh, in Pakistan. In other words, is the criminal justice system one in which the um, accused and accuser have representation? Is it a, uh, a there are two back? separate courts. One is the British system court, and one is the Sharia court, <coughs> which applies to the Hadood ordinances, which is the zina law, the adultery law, the rape law. They apply to these. I missed the first part. Is, does that answer? In order to bring, I guess, let me ask you this: In order to bring a charge, uh, can anybody, when, when they were, when the men are angry with their women and then falsely accuse them, are there any kind of safeguards, of governmental safeguards, that false charges cannot be brought in the first place? No, this is all in the hands of the mullah, yeah. the mosque mullah. I mean, they just go to him and they say. This woman, I found her sleeping with that man, and they were committing zina, and how can I bear it, etc., etc. And very often the women are locked up for their own protection, you know. So uh, the, the, it's a, uh, this has to change, you know. And uh, this is something Benazi tried to remove. It was impossible. Religious law is very hard to remove. Now, at least uh, Musharraf has taken steps towards it and vowed to at least dilute it under the Women Protection of Women's Act. And he has succeeded in releasing all the women who were jailed because of this, because it's just such a hideous thing. Everybody agreed this is wrong, you know. So I don't know how it'll end up, but I, I am hopeful. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, would, it be, would it be correct uh, to, uh, to, <coughs> to say the following? that most of the actions that we see in terms of demeaning the women in Pakistan have more to do with culture and what we saw with the huge land holdings as opposed to something which is religious. Absolutely right. And, and, and there's a big misnomer uh, within people who are in the West of blaming religion for those kind of things that happen, whereas those are all cultural 
and traditional and ingrained in the in the landed uh, 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 the landlord system. Yeah, th these are you are absolutely right. They're entrenched in the Punjabi culture. Let's say. I mean, uh, is Mimi here? Oh, there she is. Uh, Mimi Kilgar runs what is known as the Susan Smith Prize for Best Plays. It's, it's a wonderful award, and all people who write plays, are, and it's for women, we want it. <laughs> and just now, the award has gone to a play called Behesti. Now, this is a play about honor killing among the Sikhs, not among the Muslims. So honor killing is not restricted only to the Muslims as it is portrayed here. The Sikh community indulges in it. Some of my Hindu friends said in our village, if, if a man and a woman are caught having something of an affair, they are killed. So these things are cultural. They are certainly, they have nothing to do with religion. You're absolutely right. And culture is only something which will change with prosperity, with education. The moment a Pakistani gets rich, he sends his daughter to school, you know? So these things will change with some prosperity. Yeah, you wanted to do something for Pakistan, try and set up a school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we have to stop here. Sorry, we need to A little plug. A little plug. My books are outside. <laughs> if you want me to sign. Them. We just have a couple of announcements before you leave. Oh, sorry. I'm going to, and then please go out and look at the books. Uh, I'm going to make one since I'm just remembering. There's, for those of you who are interested in South Asia, there's a talk next week on the translation and transmission of Kama Sutra. It's, uh, it's by a historian from Newport, San Antonio. It's at 4 p.m. on Monday. If you're interested, please, uh, I'll give you the details. Uh, I don't want to bother you now.